Welcome to A Taste of Torah, where you discover the sweetness of the scroll each week with your host, Rhonda Wagner, as she shares faith and encouragement from a Christian perspective found in weekly Torah readings. Come listen and let your heart be lifted with a little taste of Torah. Grace and peace, beloved of God, it's that time again. Let's talk Torah. We are about to begin the book of Deuteronomy. And this week's Torah portion is Devarim, which is translated, These Are the Words. If you've been on this journey of Sweetness of the Scroll and talking Torah with us, then you know, I mean, this is the last book of the Torah. And so we're so excited to have made it this far. And we are really in... Um, encouraged and excited to share with you some thoughts around this first um, portion of Deuteronomy. And so let's just get right into it. We kind of have to apologize though, because it is Thursday and usually we try to get the podcast um, uploaded by Tuesday, but we've really had to just take a moment to pause and to ponder exactly what we felt Holy Spirit wanted us to share and we do believe that we have some encouragement for you from this particular portion so we pray that you're encouraged let's look at Deuteronomy Um, Devarim covers Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 3 verse 22 it's not that long of a portion and as I mentioned a few moments ago Devarim means these are the words and so here we are with Moses and the second generation and they are right on the border of um, the promised land Canaan about to cross over into the Jordan there's been some battles from the last portion which Moses will go into but I want to give you just a brief overview of what is going on here in Deuteronomy and so Deuteronomy the word itself actually is translated second law. Okay, it's translated second law. It's a Greek word for second law, I believe. And sometimes it's referred to as, you know, the book of the Torah. Because basically Moses is going to go through several different, I want to say sermons. Some commentaries call them discourses where he's speaking to the second generation and preparing them to go in and to conquer and take the promise of God take the promised land and so these are the words are the very beginning of this portion and when it starts out it's very interesting you have to pay attention because um, we know that the Torah was um, traditionally was written by Moses going back to Genesis but when you start out you hear a narrator's voice so you know it's not Moses speaking at the very beginning so um, it's narrated by the biblical scribes of that you know of the time those that came together and wrote uh, the Torah and put it together but as you read through it you have to pay attention to what Moses is saying and whom he's speaking to and the history that he's given to the second generation and it's really interesting because when he starts out and he's going through the history he is using pronouns referencing the second generation as if they were present though they were present but they were not of age um in discussing you know this first portion goes through when the leaders were chosen and then the rebellion at Kadesh Barnea when the spies were sent out and when he's speaking he's saying you when really he's speaking to the children of that first generation that were judged and died in the wilderness and so um, what we can take away from that is that we are connected to our ancestors. We're unfortunately we're even connected to the sin of our ancestors because um, the Lord declared in Exodus that the the sin of the parents visits the generations to the third and fourth generation, and so um, our descendants are connected to us. You know they're connected. Thank God to the blessing, but they're also connected to 
our sin or our judgment. And so unless and until that sin is reconciled through repentance and the blood of Jesus, then um, there are issues. There are issues. And unfortunately, as we travel through the book of Numbers, we saw how that second generation replayed the sins of the first generation. Almost to where you were thinking, is this happening again? Like at the 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 rock, the first time Moses was at the rock, he um, spoke to the rock. The second time he hit the rock, you know, you were thinking, what's going on? Well, it was two different generations where Moses was actually at the same place, but with the second generation. And the second generation committed the same sin that the first generation did. And so... Um, it's really important as we read through the scripture and to get a, a good understanding of the story of the text, the story of redemption, the story of the Exodus, the story of God's plan of redemption for his people of which we belong because we've been engrafted in as believers in Yeshua. Um, it's important for us to take our time to understand um the narrative and what is actually happening. So, wanted to just give that brief um, introduction to um, the beginning of this portion. And so, let's just read a couple verses. And we're kind of going to go on a... I might surprise you where we're going to go. Because I feel like these first three chapters are really rehearsing the journey of... Um, the people of God and the second generation needs to be reminded of what the journey was. And so Moses is um, giving them their own history as God's people. And so let's look at Deuteronomy 1.1. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan. I'm reading from the NIV. That is in the Araba opposite Suf between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, Dizahab. It takes 11 days to go from Horeb, which is the other name for Mount Sinai, to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. So here we have a timestamp, okay, which will take us all the way back to when God brought them out of Egypt. And brought them to Mount Sinai or or Horeb. It actually only took 11 days to get from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. Where the spies were sent out. Where the it wasn't the first rebellion. Because the first rebellion was really the golden calf. But the major rebellion that caused the judgment to come against the first generation. It was only an 11 days journey. But because the people have rebelled against God even before then, all right, he made them stay and wander in the wilderness. Okay, they wandered in the wilderness because they decided they were not going to go in and take the land. And if we remember, why did they decide they were not going to go in and take the land? Because of the people that inhabited the land. And we're going to get into that a little bit later. Because I think it's really important. If you read through slowly, you begin to understand why Moses is saying what he is saying. In this first sermon that he's given to this second generation. Because he knows he is not going to go in. And that he is going to go sleep with his forefathers. He's going to die. He's not going in. And so he's being very purposeful and, t and intentional about what he is sharing with this generation. And so the narrator is telling us here a little bit of a timestamp. This is was exactly 11 days. It only took 11 days to get from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. So then it says, now we get to modern, the not modern, but the present time. So it says, verse 3 says, In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them. So here we are in the 40th year. The 40th year on the first day of the 11th month of the year. Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him 
concerning them. Verse 4 says, This was after he had defeated Sion, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, and at Edre had defeated Ah, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. Okay, so in verse 3 already, we have the narrator mentioning that Moses proclaimed the history basically of Israel. Everything that the Lord had commanded him to speak to the people. He's proclaiming here um, at this border, at the Jordan. Okay. And he says, yeah, and this was after he defeated two kings. King Sion and King Og. Who were both descendants of giants. So... Not going to go into that just yet because we're going to get into it a little bit later. But verse 3 and 4 is already talking about how Moses was not afraid to deal with the giants. The very thing that the people, the first generation refused to do, Moses as the leader did. And he was demonstrated, that's what leadership does. He was demonstrated what the second generation was going to need to be able to do to go in and to possess their promise. And so, verse 5 says, East of the Jordan, in the territory of Moab, Moses began to expand this law, which really should be translated Torah, saying, The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, Mount Sinai, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in the Arabah, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev, and along the coast to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon as far as the great river, the Euphrates. See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land. The Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to their descendants after them. So this is what Moses begins to, to preach to the second generation. This is what God said, because some of them weren't even probably even born. Okay, this was their parents. All right, so Moses is telling them, this is what happened. When we were still at Mount Sinai, after everything had happened and, you know, they had made the, the tabernacle and it was time to break camp. The Lord said, okay, here we go. You're out. It's time to move. Now, all of this is not exactly chronological because we know so much overlaps between Leviticus and, and Numbers. But just follow along. He's given them the major highlights of their history as in the wilderness what actually went down and so then verse 9 says at that time i said to you you are too heavy a burden for me to carry alone the lord your god has increased your number so that today you are as numerous as the stars in the sky which was the promise god had given to abraham back in genesis Verse 11 says, May the Lord, the God of your ancestors, increase you a thousand times and bless you as he has promised. So now Moses, as the leader and prophet, proclaims a blessing over the people. Verse 12 says, But how can I bear your problems and your burdens and your dis disputes all by myself? Choose some wise, understanding, and respected men from each of your tribes, and I will set them over you. And so... You remember when Jethro was traveling with Moses, Jethro had told Moses he was a, he needed to, you know, the burden of the people was too much. It was going to be too much for him to handle by itself. So Jethro, who was a priest of Midian and has a, a portion named after himself, really was helping Moses in his leadership and telling him, you got to choose leaders. You got to choose leaders and put them over the people. And so... Um, Moses is reminding the second generation of what happened. Okay, so let's um, jump ahead a little bit. He goes in and just talks about how he charged the judges and, and put them over the people. So let's go to verse 19. Then as the Lord our God commanded us, we set out from Horeb and went toward the hill country of the Amorites through all that vast and dreadful wilderness that you have seen. And so we reached Kadesh Barnea. Then I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. 
See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Verse 22 says, Then all of you came to me and said, See how Mark Lewis is at all of you. <laughs> all of you came to me and said, Let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us <clears throat> and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we will come to. Verse 23 says, The idea seemed good to me, so I selected 12 of you, one man from each tribe. They left and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eshkul and explored it, taking with them some of the fruit of the land. They brought it down to us and reported, It is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. So that was one part of the report. If you listen to the podcast, we do realize that they... Gave a good report in the beginning. The fact that the land was good. Exactly what God had proclaimed and prophesied over the land. And promised to Abraham. Was exactly what they had encountered. But then there were some. Okay. That after they gave that partial report. They decided to um, give an evil report. And so let's read on. And so this is Moses. Retelling the history. Reminding the second generation. This is what happened. Yes it was your parents. But you are also responsible okay because now you're here and you need to know what it's going to take for you to go in and to take the land okay so verse 26 says but you were unwilling to go up you rebelled against the command of the lord your god this is an example of what i was saying earlier as in my brief introduction of how he's saying you is really the second generation that he's speaking to the first generation perished in the wilderness but they are the seed of their parents. And so they are responsible for this, this, the center of their parents. They need, they need to have a heart of repentance and to lay hold to the promise of God there at the border, okay, of the promised land east of the Jordan. Verse 27 says, you grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? <clears throat> our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. So when the spies came back with the evil report about the people who inhabited the land, they made the people be afraid. And operate in a spirit of unbelief. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. So here we go. Alright, so already. This is verse. Let's see. Verse 28. We've already had mentioned. 1, 2. Ak, Sion, King of the Amorites. Which we will discuss later. The Amorites were a tribe, a clan, or tribe that were descendants from the giants, the Nephilim, and the Raphaim. King Agabashan was a giant, all right, a descendant of the giants. Okay, so we have one, two later on. Moses mentioned again the Amorites, all right, and then here we have the Anakites. This is the fourth mention of a giant clan. And so, as we begin to discuss this a little bit more, the thing that really jumped out at me about this first introduction, or this first portion, is how Moses, and even the narrator at the beginning, when he introduces Moses, he says, yeah, Moses proclaimed all this after he defeated the two giants on the, the you know, the plains of Moab. Moses was no joke, okay? Moses was like, all right, we're going to have to take care of business. And he was setting an example for the second generation. And he's letting them know, listen, we traveled through all this wilderness and this land anyway. We knew the giants were here anyway. So why are we going to shrink back because they're here? All right? They were there. And so what I feel like is really interesting is, if you're like me, when people talk about this stuff, no one's telling us that the giants, listen, the giants go all the way back even to Abraham. When Abraham was fighting with the, 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 the kings, the four and the five kings back in Genesis 14, there were giant tribes back there. 
So this whole thing of with the giants was not a new thing for the ancient Near East. But when we study these pages, we don't start talking about giants until we get to David and Goliath. But even here, when Moses is talking to the second generation and preparing them to go in and take the land, he is reminding them of the promise of God, how God promised he would drive out his enemies and that they were not to be afraid of any of the people that inhabited the promised land because God had promised to drive out all the tribes that were there. He was going to go before them. He was going to send the angel before them. And he was going to drive them out. But they had to be prepared to take the land. And not be afraid to go in battle. With the Lord being their front and rear guard. Okay so we see that. You listen Moses is reminding them. Yeah. They saw the Anakites there. The, the, the spies saw the Anakites there. So verse 29 says. Then I said to you. Do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God who is going before you. Here it is Moses. Here it is. Going before you. Will fight for you. As he did for you in Egypt. Before your very eyes. And in the wilderness. There you saw. How the Lord your God. The Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. The Yuhe Vavhe. The sacred name of, of God. Carried you. As a father carries his son. All the way you went. Until you reached this place. They would have never even made it. To where they're at right now is what Moses is saying. Unless the Lord had carried you as a father carries a son and made the way for you. This is 40 years he has protected them in a wilderness, desert area where he had to provide water, sun, shade, quail, manna, and even protect them from the other people. Traveling through these different areas and regions where there were giant clans. Moses saying, Don't be afraid, don't be terrified. The Lord is going before you. And but here, here's the here's the um here's the clinger. Verse 32 In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God. Verse 33 Who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night. In a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. The angel of the Lord went before them. The Shekinah glory of the Lord went before them. As we read in Numbers, Moses and the people in the camp, they did not stop anywhere unless the cloud stopped. The cloud that was their shade by day. And the fire that was their warmth by night. Unless the cloud, the Shekinah moved, they did not move. So what's Moses saying right here? Listen, that was the Shekinah, the presence of the Lord. The angel of the Lord was going before us the whole time. Showing us the safe places to be. Where to camp. When to move. For 40 years. For a whole generation. Verse 34. When the Lord heard what you said. What did they say? The Lord hates us. Go back. The Lord hates us. He done brought us out of Egypt for us to sit out here and die. And to let us fall into the hands of the Amorites. That's what they confess. God, the Lord God, our deliverer, brought us out of Egypt. And is going to allow us to fall into the hands of our enemies. And so when the Lord heard that, verse 34, he was angry and solemnly swore, verse 35, No one from this evil generation shall see the good land I swore to give your ancestors, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh. He will see it, and I will give him and his descendants the land he set his feet on, because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Mm. Caleb had a different spirit if we go back to Numbers. If you go back to that Numbers, I want to say it's Numbers 13, 14. Caleb had a different spirit. And Caleb was not a young man, according to tradition. He was not a young man, okay? But he had a different spirit. And he believed the promise of God. Verse 37, because of you, the Lord became angry with me. 
Moses, he he getting he giving them the four one one right now. He's keeping it real. Because of you, he said, the Lord became angry with me also and said, you shall not enter it either. Verse 38, but your assistance, Joshua, the son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him because he will lead Israel to inherit it. Now, I don't know what, I don't know how Moses dealt with that. i am be honest with you. To have led the people all this time and to realize that his disobedience before the people remember he was supposed to speak to the rock and he hit the rock and um when he struck the rock the lord said that he didn't honor him in, in the midst of the people and so he wasn't going to allow him to go in to see the land he allowed well he wasn't going to allow him to go in to possess the land he did allow him to go up on the mountain and to look at it but he wasn't going to be able to go in and so Moses he is telling him listen because of you all I got myself hemmed up and now the Lord was angry with me because of the way I responded and so now I'm not going in and I need to prepare your next leader, Joshua, and encourage him to go in and possess the land. And so he's reminding them, listen, yes, the giants are there. But the Lord had already promised. This is not no new thing. The giants was not a new thing. The giants go back to Genesis. Okay? The giants are not a new thing. Why in our modern day church sermons we don't know anything about this is... I don't know have the answer. It's, you know, I recently came across, um, you know, books and reading about all this. And if you've listened to any of the podcasts, then you know, Dr. Michael Heiser and others, even the Bible Project teaches on Genesis 6 and how the giants came into being in the Nephilim and the second generation of the Nephilim was the Rathium and how these clans continued even after the flood. Because the flood came to destroy those hybrid races of people. But somehow another incursion happened and they showed up again. But the Lord had a plan to displace and to destroy them. Okay? To destroy them. And he was going to use his people. That was their purpose. Their purpose His purpose in choosing Israel was to go in and possess the land. And for Israel to be a kingdom of priests to show the truth to the other nations that he is the true and living God. So that they would stop worshiping false gods, little G's, okay, who were actually fallen angels in rebellion to the true and living God. And then begin to serve him, Yahweh, the Lord. We're going to get into that a little bit later. All right, and going off on a tangent. All right, so um, he knows Moses says, listen, he's got to take Joshua and he's got to encourage him because he's going to take the, the second generation in. So verse 39 says, and the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children who do not yet know good from evil, I'm sorry, know good from bad, they will enter the land. I will give it to them and they will take possession of it. But as for you, turn around and set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. So at Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, that's when they had started wandering. That's, that was it. They had to turn around and just wander. Verse 41 says, Then you reply, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight. Now they want to change their mind. As the Lord our God commanded us. So every one of you put on his weapons, thinking it is easy to go up into the hill country. Verse 42, But the Lord said to me, Tell them, Do not go up. Do not go up and fight, because I will not be with you. You will be defeated by your enemies. So after they had sinned, they they wanted to try to act the presumption and try to rectify their wrong and just go up and go fight. And they end up getting defeated. And Moses had told them, the Lord's not with you. I wouldn't do this if I was you. They were acting in presumption. Verse 43 says, so I told you, but you would not listen. You rebelled against the Lord's command. And in your arrogance, you marched up into the hill country. The Amorites... 
who lived in those hills came out against you. They chased you like a swarm of bees and beat you down from Seir all the way to Hormah. You came back and wept before the Lord, but he paid no attention to your weeping and turned a deaf ear to you. And so you stayed in Kadesh many days, all the time you spent there. Moses is given the history. Okay. So he's telling him, listen, this is what happened at Kadesh Barnea. This is how the generation rebelled against God and against his promise. And the giants were there. The giants was not a new thing for us. The ancient cultures knew about the giants. But the people did not believe the word of God. They did not believe the promise of God when he declared to them that he had chosen them as his own. That he was going to be the Lord their God and was going to take them into the land. And that he was going to drive out all the inhabitants. He was going to go before them and send his angel before them to drive them out and put fear in the people. Remember he said that. He said, I'll send my terror before you to put fear in the people. So that you'll have you'll be victorious. But they chose not to believe. And when they rebelled against God, he was angry. And he brought a judgment against that first generation. And so Moses is rehearsing that entire history at the east of the Jordan, letting the second generation know this is how it went all down. And this is why we were forty years wandering and you had to grow up in the wilderness. You had to grow up in the wilderness because of what happened. And so chapter 2 goes into the wanderings. I'm going to read a little bit of that because the very end goes into the defeat, defeat of the um, end of the portion that is. The defeat of Zion, the king, and the defeat of Og. Which I'm not going to read through all that. But um, you see here, it's a lot of talk about the giants. Okay? And it took me a while to kind of ponder um Moses' attention here He's saying yeah you're going to go in there You're going to deal with some giants Don't think you're not going to have to deal with it But you're going to have to be the generation That says we're going to go in And we're going to deal with the giants The last generation didn't want to deal with the giants The last generation didn't feel like They had the the Promise of God And the power of God And God's, God's spirit working on their behalf To defeat the giant. And so they shrunk back. But Joshua and that second generation needed to be the people that said, Oh, we're, 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 we're well able. We're well able. That's what Caleb said, right? We are well able to go in. And Caleb had a different spirit. Joshua had a different spirit. And that's the spirit that we have to be as believers in Yeshua. When we face circumstances... And situations now, right now, listen, they have physical, physical clans and giants, and we think that we don't have the same kind of spiritual entities at work in our culture, but we do. We have the same type of spiritual entities at work, they're just not manifested and visible, and most people are not able to discern these things that are at work through different systems, governmental systems, political systems. There are spiritual entities at work, okay. There are things in, in, in the evil that's in the world. When you hear of some of the things that happen in the world and things that um, human beings do to other human beings, you have to understand that evil is real and that people are under the influence of demonic spirits because no person that wouldn't that knows the true and the living God and sees every other person as the image bearer of God would do some of the horrific things that we see being done to women, to children, to, you know, to people in the street. And so we are dealing with these type of giants, for lack of a better word. We have giants, but we have to begin to become the people of faith, the kingdom, the kingdom people that are willing to face off these spiritual entities and know that the Lord our God has gone before us and so chapter 2 goes into the wanderings so 
2 verse 1 says, Then we turned back and set out toward the wilderness along the route of the Red Sea as the Lord had directed me. And for a long time we made our way around the hill country of Seir. Then the Lord said to me, You have made your way around this hill country long enough. Now turn north. Give the people these orders. You are to... You are about to pass through the territory of your relatives, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir. They will be afraid of you, but be very careful. Do not provoke them to, to war, for I will not give you any of their land, not even enough to put your foot on. I have given Esau the hill country of Seir as his own. You are to pay them in silver for the food you eat and the water you drink. So see, God, listen, he keep his word. He said, I gave the land to Esau, so when you get there, just don't don't mess with them. I'm not giving you any of their land. You're going to pay your way through. You're going to walk in righteousness. You're going to walk in, in integrity. Give them what's due theirs. You ain't going to use up their resources and not pay for it. This is how, this is kingdom economics, okay? This is how you do things when you're in the kingdom. You do things in integrity, all right? And so the Lord's given them instructions. Verse 7 says, The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through this vast wilderness. These 40 years the Lord your God has been with you. And you have not lacked anything. They were in the wilderness. A whole generation grew up in the wilderness. Eating manna, food from heaven that kept them healthy. And those that died, they died even... Either if they end up falling into judgment, example, cause of rebellion or the different plagues that came because of sin, or some just died of natural causes. Okay? But it wasn't because the Lord did not protect them. It was because of their own sin and disobedience. The whole time, the Lord protected that second generation because he needed a a people that would believe him so that they could go in and take the land and be this kingdom of priests that he had covenant with. Remember the ketubah back in Exodus. They had had the covenant meal up on the mountain. This is a covenant that he established. And so Moses goes on and he begins to talk about as they travel through. So then he told them, listen, they weren't supposed to mess with the Moabites either. Because some of that land was given to some of Lot's descendants. Then verse 10 says, The Emites used to live there, a people strong and numerous, as tall as the Anakites. So here, we have another tribe that showed up. The Emites that were as tall as the Anakites. The Anakites were the people that they saw um, when they went and spied out the land. We know that, that Moses, they had already defeated um, Sion and Og. Okay, on the border, on the plains of Moab. So here we have another tribe, the Emites. And then verse 11 says, like the Anakites, they too were considered Raphaites, which means they were descendants, descendants of the Raphaim. Raphaim is another term for the second generation of the giants. So first it was the Nephilim that were the first offspring of the sons of God, the fallen angels that slept with the women back in Genesis 6. Had the Nephilim. And then the descendants of the Nephilim were the Raphaim. Which sometimes were referred to as the Raphaites. But the Moabites called them the Emites. So they had a different name. Is what Moses is saying. They had different terms. Different um, clans, tribes had different names for these clans of giants. Verse 12 says the Horites used to live in Seir. But the descendants of Esau drove them out. They destroyed the Horats from before them and settled in their place just as Israel did in the land the Lord gave them as a possession. So God had empowered Esau to deal with some of the tribes, the Horites that were there and inhabiting the land as well. Verse 13 says, And the Lord said, Now get up and cross the Zared Valley. So we cross the valley. Verse 14 says, 38 years passed from the time we left Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the Zared Valley. By then the entire generation of fighting men had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. The Lord's hand was against them until he had completely eliminated them from the camp. Now when the last of these fighting men 
among the people had died, the Lord said to me, Today you are to pass by the region of Moab at Ar. And when you come to the Ammonites, do not harass them or provoke them to war, for I will not give you possession of any land belonging to the Ammonites. I have given it a possession to the descendants of Lot. That too was considered the land of the Raphaites. Moses is referring to the giants again who used to live there. But the Ammonites called them the Zamzumites. This is another giant clan people. They were a people strong and numerous as tall as the Anakites. And the Lord destroyed them from before the Ammonites. Okay. He destroyed them who drove them out and settled in their place. The Lord had done the same for the descendants of Esau who lived in Seir when he destroyed the Horites from before them. So what is Moses saying? He's saying, look, he's referring to Esau who wasn't even the favorite son. Okay. They are the descendants of Jacob. Those that have the promise. But because the Lord had even made a promise to Esau, he helped Esau's descendants drive out the giants. And Lot, who wasn't even favored, Abraham was the favored one. Because he was descendant, you know, of Abraham. He was his nephew. He even favored him. He favored him and allowed his descendants to drive out the clan. So what is Moses saying? He's saying, look, our other relatives, cousins... You know, our other relatives have driven out these giant clans. So you, as the people that have covenant with God, the the descendants of Jacob, y'all must know that God is not going to let us down. That y'all can go in and drive it out. He is giving them a play-by-play of the history so that they will know not to be afraid to go in and drive them out. Okay, I'm reading a little bit more. I'm going to go back to verse 22. The Lord had done the same for the descendants of Esau who lived in Seir when he destroyed the Horats, Horites from before them. They drove them out and have lived in their place this day. And as for the Avites who lived in the villages as far as Gaza, the Kaf- Kaptorites coming out from Kaptor destroyed them and settled in their place. And then he goes into the defeat of Sion the king and Heshbon. And then verse 3, I mean chapter 3 goes in a defeat of Og, the king of Bashan. I don't have time to go into all that. I'm going to stop right there. Because then you can read the rest for yourself and see how Moses, he is giving, this is like a pep rally. This is like a pep rally where he's going through and he's telling them all the history of the giant slayers. <clears throat> okay? The giant slayers. You're going to have to be those people that decide to go in and slay the giants. And know that God is with you. That the Lord Yahweh, what he has promised, he's able to perform. And so, it's very interesting. I mean, you kind of, when you read through, you think, all right, well, Moses is just, he's just rehearsing the whole thing. He's going back through the whole history. But then when you begin to see exactly what's narrated and what, 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 um, biblical accounts are being shared, you see that Moses has an intent in this first sermon that he's given to the second generation. He's saying, listen, you got history, okay? Even your cousins was able to go in and take care of business. So you need to be those people that are saying, we're going to take care of business. They don't even have the blessing. Esau did not have the blessing. But God kept his promise. He allowed Esau. He said Esau could have the land. He did give him something. Jacob had stole the blessing. Okay? But Jacob was the favored one. He was the favored one. Esau gave up his birthright. He sold it for the the stew, okay? And that had grieved God's heart. But even so, even in that, God still allowed him to drive out the giants that had so distorted creation, the hybrid races, the hybrids that was that was set on destruction, okay? He had turned them over and allowed Esau and his descendants to take them out. Why? Because God was trying to cleanse the people from serving these false gods. False gods, not in the sense that we think they're not real. False gods in the sense that they were fallen angels who 
walked away from their original assignment that God had given them to watch over these nations and people and allow the people to begin to worship them. Alright, I don't have time to go into all that. I'll put some links. I'll put some links in the chat to some resources. I always try to give y'all resources that I feel like will be informative and open up your understanding around the scriptures because listen, I know I'm telling the truth when I tell you that up until maybe five, six years ago, and I had listened even listening and and listening to people teach the Torah. People will do not talk about all these giants that Moses is is naming out and calling out. And this is an important part of the redemptive story. This is important to understand. Understand why? Not because we we know that Jesus didn't then dealt with the enemy but so that we understand who the enemy is and how the enemy has used um and distorted God's creation and how he intends to continue to try to distort God's creative order which we do see now I ain't going to go into now but you understand what I'm saying read between the lines how the enemy is trying to take God's creative order and continue to distort the truth And so, <clears throat> I want to read an excerpt. Well, no, before I go to this excerpt, <clears throat> I found a list <clears throat> in this book, which I'm going to put in the podcast notes. This is a book called Giants, the Sons of God. Very good resource. I haven't read through the whole book. I kind of use it like as, as a resource. I go and read certain chapters or whatever. But this is by Douglas Van Dorn. Who actually wrote the um um I gotta look it up because I don't want to give it to you wrong. He wrote the um question and answer companion to the unseen realm. So I put many a times in the podcast notes the unseen realm by Dr. Michael Heiser, the late Dr. Michael Heiser, who just went home to glory um a few months ago. Um the Unseen Realm, The Question and Answer Companion was written by Douglas Van Dorn, who was um, a friend of Dr. Heiser. And so this resource is, is very well researched, but it's very easy to read. It's not as hard to read as The Unseen Realm. Um, and so if you're interested and you just want to go on a little research tangent and really begin to understand about this Genesis 6 and what happened there and how you do really see it played out through um, other portions of scripture, then I would encourage you to check out the book. Um, but in his resource, in his book, um, he has a chart where he gives you the different giant clans and the different chapters in the Old Testament where you see them referenced. And so the first reference, of course, is in Genesis 6, where it's referenced, the giant clans are referenced as the Nephilim. But then in Genesis 14, as I mentioned, when it talks about Abraham, well, at that time he was Abram, and when he goes to fight to rescue his nephew Lot... The clans that are mentioned in Genesis 14. So the clans mentioned in Genesis 14 are the Raphaim, the Zuzim, which Moses mentioned um, in this last chapter that I just um, read to you. The Emin, the Horites, the Malachites, and the Amorites. That's one, two, three, four, five, six different giant clans mentioned in Genesis 14. Then in Genesis 15... Um, the tribes that are mentioned, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites. Numbers 13, which we just went through some of those portions, the Nephilim, the Amalekites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Anakim. And then here in this portion, Deuteronomy 1 through 3, the tribes that are mentioned, the giant clans, the Raphaim, the Zazumim, the Zumim, the Emim, the Horites, the Amorites, the Anakim, the Hivites, and the Avim. There were plenty of giants mentioned before Goliath, before David. Okay? And so, um, that's food for thought. Do with that what you will. I mean, I, 
my encouragement is just we have to be like Bereans. We have to study the scripture. And we have to understand um, what the scripture is saying. Because when you begin to study out some of this and understand Satan's seed. Going back to Genesis 3.15, Satan has seed. And Satan's seed is in enmity against the woman's seed. The capital S seed, which we know is Yeshua, and the seed, the lower seed, which then becomes us because we are engrafted into Israel and we are in Christ. We are his seed. We are co-heirs and co-laborers with Christ Jesus. So, listen, it's good there's evil. Evil is real and evil is intelligent. Okay, and we tend to believe that the only person that we really have to deal with is Satan, Hasatan, the accuser. There's other entities out there. There's other stuff going on. All right, other evil entities going out. Is we? It's not. That's not. It's just not one. It's just not one. And this is what you see in Scripture when you see that God called. He set apart a people. He elevated a people. He covenanted it with a people to be his light, to be his glory, to demonstrate his glory in order to reveal to the other nations that they were worshiping false gods. Really, later on, when we read Moses hits the nail on the head, worshiping demons. And so... I don't want to get ahead of myself. Now I'm going to go into um, sharing this, um, a little excerpt from a book that I, I read recently. And this is why I love reading the Torah because I just had to go back to this book and read some chapters because of something significant that happened in my life. And the Torah is timely. The Torah, when you start reading through the Torah, the Torah is going to speak to your life. It's going to speak to your situation. And it just so happens that um, this book it has a parable in it that where the author uses the life of Moses um, as part of his story and what he's teaching you in this book. And so this first portion, Moses is exhorting the second generation and he's given them um, play by play. Of how they cousins dealt with giants because the Lord kept his word. Now you're going to go in and you're going to deal with these giants. And I already set the example for you. Because I didn't shrink back. I dealt with Sion. I dealt with Og. I'm not even going to go into the possessed land. But I'm giving you this best, the best pep talk I could give you. To go in and deal with these giants. And not be like the first generation. And, be, and believe a lie that you're not well able. And so in this book called The Dream Giver by Bruce Wilkinson, it says following the subtitles, following your God-given destiny. All right. It's a very good book. I'm going to put a link in the, the podcast notes as well. The very end of the book, he's talking about giants. And all through the book, he talks about Moses and being a leader in, in discovering a dream, a God-given dream, a dream that comes from um, the dream giver. Which is Yahweh. And so he talks about how Yahweh uses a most unusual battle plan. And we see that. Okay. We see that um, even when Joshua, when they do go into the land, when Joshua deals with Jericho, we see that God's ways are not our ways, that his thoughts are not our thoughts. Okay. But um, I'm going to read a couple excerpts. Um, this first one from page like 141. And this chapter is called The Heart of a Warrior. He says, has God ever asked you to take a big risk to face a giant for your dream? When he does, something important is at stake. Because as you'll see, your giant exists in the first place because God is up to something larger than you. Larger than your dream. Larger even than your victory. I gotta read that again. Has God ever asked you to take a big risk to face a giant for your dream? When he does, something important is at stake. Because as you'll see, your giant exists in the first place. Because God is up to something larger than you. 
larger than your dream, larger even than a victory. So there's a purpose to the giants. There was a reason why God had called Israel to go in and take out the giants. And even allowed Israel's cousins and relatives to take land um, that were inhabited by the giants. There was a reason for it. And so Bruce goes on to say, um, <clears throat> what is that purpose? If God has the power to part the sea with a rod or knock a city down with a shout, why doesn't he use all that power to remove our giants once and for all? Okay, so then he goes into the subtitle. This next section is the reason for giants. For a long time, I searched for the answer, but it eluded me at every time, every turn. Then one day I realized I had been looking up at giants from my perspective and not down on them from God's. The occasion was a conference for several hundred dreamers in South Africa, and I was in the middle of presenting statement by statement a list of what God had said about why he sometimes chose to perform miracles to defeat Israel's giants. So there was a reason for God choosing Israel to go in and to defeat the giants and to make the decision to allow him to go before them there was a reason for it. And so this is what Bruce begins to write. Suddenly a pattern of truth emerged. A pattern I had somehow missed before. Look at the recurring message in these verses. Okay. And then he begins to quote verses. And if you've been listening to the podcast. Then some of these verses will resonate with you. Alright, here's the first verse. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God that brings you out. That is taken from Exodus 6-7. I hope I'm giving you the right the right quote. Let me just double check. I don't want to give you the wrong verse. I don't want to give you the wrong verse. This is so good. This is so good. This is so good. So this is this is the revelation that Bruce received about giants. This is the revelation that Bruce received. Why God allowed Israel to be used to drive out the, the giants. And why God asked us to take big risks. And to face off our giants. So that we could do what? So that we can demonstrate. So that you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Who brings you out. And that's Exodus 6-7. His next verse is that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. And that's Exodus 9, 14. That my name may be declared in all the earth. And that's Exodus 9, 16. That you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son. The mighty things I have done in Egypt. That you may know that I am the Lord. That's Exodus 10, 2. I will gain honor over Pharaoh. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. That's Exodus 14, 17, and 18. Then all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. That's Joshua 4, 24. These are all scripture references that Bruce says, this is why you have to face off your giant. This is why God calls us to do things that are beyond our own understanding, that are beyond what we feel like we can even accomplish, that require his divine intervention, that require his favor so that the people will know that he is God, so that we will know that he is God and that he's our deliverer and that he brings us out and that he opens doors that no man can shut. And so when he, Moses is given this, this, this sermon to the second generation. He's recounting all these battles. He's recounting his battle. He's recounting what Esau did. He's recounting what the descendants of Lot did. He said, listen, our cousins. Listen, our relatives. They didn't even have the blessing that you have. And they were able to go in and face off the giants. Now you go 
and, and lay hold to the promise. Take the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord was going before them. The Shekinah glory was going before them. And what Bruce showed show is showing us in this in his revelation is that the purpose of the giants is to display the glory of God. When God gives you something to do that's beyond what you feel you could do, it's so that his glory can be revealed. It's so that his glory can be revealed. It's bigger than the dream. It's bigger than your obedience. It's bigger than the assignment. It's bigger even than your victory. It's so that his glory can be revealed. And so that people will come to the saving knowledge of Yeshua. And know that he is the true and the living God. That is all that I have for you today. I pray that you are encouraged. And that you hear the spirit through these words that I'm sharing. That God has called you to be a giant slayer. And you facing off your giant has more to do with his glory being revealed in and through you. Than you even understand. But if you have ears to hear. And that you have a heart. That will just submit to his purpose in your life. That you can be a giant slayer. And the glory of God can be revealed through your life. In one simple act of faith and obedience. If you'll just have the spirit like Caleb had. And the spirit of Joshua. You'll operate in a different spirit. And just follow the word of the Lord. Follow what Yahweh has spoken to you wholeheartedly and don't be afraid be courageous and go and slay the giant and give Yahweh the glory that is due his name the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace his shalom and write his name upon you Thank you for listening and see you next week for another taste of Torah. For deeper study, join our online Torah study, Sweetness of the Scroll, by visiting our website at wordofencouragement.org.